Let's pray. Father, we are in your presence, Lord. Thank you so very much for granting us another opportunity in a new year, Lord, to gather here. And thank you so very much for speaking to us throughout 2022. And uh, we could uh, uh, know you better through the Bible studies. We, under, we could understand your scripture better, Lord. Thank you so very much for all the grace that you have shown to us in the last year. As we are starting this new year with the... Uh, uh, our Bible study, Lord, I pray for your leading and guidance and especially, Lord, through every session, Lord, we want to hear your voice. We need your illumination and revelation. Speak to us through your servants, Lord. And uh, the time we spend in Bible studies may be mutually beneficial to all of us here and uh, we may glorify your name, reflecting your love and life in and through us, Lord. Thank you very much for listening to us, Lord. We ask for your leading today also and our discussions and uh, uh, may bring glory to your name. And we may leave this place uh, with a new revelation in our hearts and uh, which may help us to break all the barrier to, barriers to experience you more intimately as never before. Thank you very much for listening to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Praveen, once again, um, a very happy new year. For those who have joined us last week, we had a blessed time of uh, prayer, uh, giving thanks for all the things in 2022 and submitting everything we have planned and the things that we have not planned for in God's hand for 2023. And this year also, we are expecting uh, more members to join us in our in our Bible study. As each of us bring different topics under God's guidance uh, for all of us to learn. So today uh, I would continue with my series on the New Testament survey. And today, uh, let me share my screen first. We will as usual start with the recap of last time and then we continue with our subject in hand today so uh, for us uh, we did we, we in our last time i think that's in last year we seen the gospel so we have seen uh, the four gospel that can be categorized into ancient biographies so they are about a person now biographies to focus on what the person was like and it was not about the their life chronologies that's what they were as a kid and then what happened as they uh, become adult and old but it is about the focus on what the person was like then we have also seen what was the purpose of writing the gospels we have also uh, dwell on why these biographies are called gospels then we briefly touched on synoptic gospels which means roughly seen together, the gospel of Matthew, Mark and Luke. And uh, why they are called as roughly seen together? Because they are looking at the life and teaching of Jesus from a similar perspective. And then we also saw who wrote it first and the similarities between the three gospel of Matthew, Mark and Luke. So that was what we covered last time. And today we would cover or uh, learn more about the gospel according to Mark. But before we jump into the book, I want to uh, help us set some guideline framework on how we will review each of the book in the New Testament. So the roughly framework that we would use would have uh, following things. We'll have, we'll cover the overview of the book. Then we'll cover the setting of the book, such as who wrote it, when it was written, to whom it was written and why it is written, why it was written. And then we'll check on the emphasis uh, of the book and we'll also cover the theological themes that are part of the book. So this would be the roughly uh, framework that we would use for most of our books. So today, if we have to see the gospel according to Mark, let's see the gospel according to Mark from this overview, uh, this framework. So first, the overview. Now, Mark's story of Jesus is known for being 
quick paced and dramatic and i'll explain you in fact it's a story is so compelling when read aloud and it reflects so many features of the hellenistic theater during that time that many scholars are convinced that this gospel was originally intended for oral presentation the gospel of mark was intended uh, for oral presentation why because the unfolding drama that this gospel uh, the unfolding drama like compares favorably with the hellenistic dramas of antiquity now we, we see in mark chapter 1 to 3 we see exorcism miracles conflict stories appear in rapid succession as jesus launches his ministry in galilee then immediately his authority is established as he demonstrate his power over disease demons and even nature now jesus authority even encompasses privileges normally reserved for god such as the ability to forgive sin and work on sabbath and this inspired harsh criticism from his opponents now as we read mark's drama we wonder who will understand that this is a son of god as we read it in chapter 1 verse 1 if this is the jewish messiah who will embrace and promote his emerging kingdom in the first half mark shows jesus public success in galilee and in adjacent hellenistic areas north and east of galilee both climaxed by feeding miracle now suddenly at a cru- crucial uh, turning point in the story jesus turned to his followers near a mountain in the far north and he asked them what they think about him as we read it in mark 8 chapter verse 27 and after two wrong answers peter says you are messiah 8 29 Mark then shifts the direction of his story sharply. Jesus begins to move south towards Judea, towards his faith at the hands of Jerusalem temple hierarchy. He predicts his own death three times, and Mark explains how Jesus is misunderstood each time. Finally, Jesus arrives at Jerusalem during Passover. in the midst of crowd of cheering galilean pilgrims who had celebrated his message in the north but as his popularity swells so does his opposition the religious leadership of jerusalem moves quickly to check jesus growing celebrity status he confront them with courage prophesies god's judgment on their world and is promptly taken into custody he is crucified but not defeated now mark ends his story with an empty tomb dazed followers and angels proclaiming his resurrection in crisp dramatic form mark closes the story by telling us that jesus disciples are silent in their astonishment and filled with fear as we read it in G, uh, chapter 16 verse 8 so that's the overview of the book of mark now let's see the next section that is setting now none of the gospel names its author the names were added later none gives its date none names the audience and sometimes they only hint at the purposes so if we are left to deduce this information as best we can from uh, we can deduce it from the content we see it involves some guesswork so we can't be too dogmatic about it now the early church tradition uh, Ira- uh, iranius and papias says that mark was connected with peter since we don't have any evidence on the contrary mark is as good name as any now with this person called john mark uh, was this person is the same person called john mark in other books probably because we have no other candidate the fact that john mark is paired with silvanus as we read it in first chapter of uh, first peter 
chapter 5 verse 12 to 13 make it likely that peter and paul knew the same man named mark but even so this doesn't help us to interpret the gospel of mark that because this isn't about mark it is about jesus and we know so little about mark personality and history that we can't say whether it influenced his telling the story of jesus so we can deduce that mark wrote the gospel of mark now when did he write according to the early church tradition it was nearly the time when peter died and according to modern scholars near the time the roman destroyed jerusalem and the temple and the, the general consensus is that it was written roughly at about uh, in the 60s ad 60 and in some ways the book was written over a span of 30 years imagine in the span of over 30 years as the stories of jesus were selected and somewhat standardized as the stories were told again and again in the presence of other eyewitnesses now remember these all stories were told from one person to another and that's that's how uh, uh, the stories were found to be real because of its connectivity and its authenticity now each author told same stories and omitted some other different we see in in different gospels so each author they told the same story and they omitted other because some stories were better suited for the audience need according to each gospel and that's how we see a little differences in all the three gospel uh, to whom he was writing now tradition says mark was writing to the romans and the lack of significant evidence on the contrary it's a good working hypothesis that mark wrote for his audience in rome now some scholars see hidden hints of the gospel intended uh, audience uh, hidden in mark's narrative and by the end of the second century, the Clement of Alexandria said with confidence that Mark wrote his gospel from Rome. Now, this is no doubt linked to the widely held tradition of Peter's martyrdom in Rome and Mark's connection with him as the recorder of his memoirs. And that's how we can deduce that it was uh, written for Romans, uh, the audience in Rome. Now, what were the circumstances when he writes? Now, we have a slightly better clue about what were the circumstances of the audience that time. Now, judging from the theme of the book and knowing a little about the early church, it is likely that Mark's reader were experiencing some sort of persecution. There is much in the book that does not address this particular need, but Mark's no doubt had several purposes in including the stories he did but some of it speaks well of the problem of suffering now the story flow and the fact that crucifixion story is such a large percentage of this book helps to make the point that jesus is a suffering messiah so when we follow this messiah it is likely to involve suffering on our part too this is so true to his audience uh, then and to us after 2000 years as well but remember this is only one of the several theme in the gospel now this material about self-denial could remind suffering christian suffering christians that it is what they signed up for yeah jesus say uh, to to deny ourselves and take up the cross now it is simply the part of following Jesus and this is the way that good conquers evil. Now the author uh, uh, Barit says if Mark gospel was composed in the 60s then it is makes a very good sense uh, against the background of Nero's persecution of Christians at Rome. So that's uh, about the circumstances. Now if you go to Mark's longer ending. Now, many of you would have seen that Mark's end very drastically at uh, chapter 16, verse 8. 
with uh, the circle of women exploring the empty tomb and fleeing in fear. That's the end, very abrupt end. You see also uh, in, in some other version, like one authority conclude the book with a shorter ending, amen. But some traditions, uh, they add verse 9 to 20, which describe the personal appearance of Jesus and his commission to the disciples. Now the later scribes wanted to give Mark a more satisfying finale. So they added the uh, verse from 9 to 20. I am missing out one second. Yeah. Yeah. Now their style is strikingly different. If you see all this version and most of their elements are taken from the parts of the New Testament. That is, if you want to see Mark uh, 16 from 9 to 11, it matches with John uh, chapter 20 verse uh, 14 to 18, chapter 16 verse 12 and 13. And it also matches with Luke 24 verse 13 to 35. So that's how uh, we see the connection with different uh, gospel for Mark longer ending. Yeah. Now let's move to the next part, emphasis of the book of Mark. Now the Mark emphasis on the following aspect, the cross, his emphasis on the discipleship, the teachings of Jesus, the messianic secret and the son of God. This is the emphasis on the book of Mark. Now let's see what is the outline. Now outline of the book of Mark can be divided in two parts. The first part is about ministry of Jesus in Galilee and it has the prologue, the first phase in the Galilean ministry, second phase of the Galilean ministry and the third phase of Galilean ministry. So in the, this is how his uh, ministry in Galilee is uh, clubbed together. That is in part one. And then second part, suffering of Jesus in Jerusalem, that we see it from verse uh, chapter 8 uh, until chapter 16. And it's divided in three parts. Jesus travels to Jerusalem, Jesus enters to Jerusalem and Jesus dies in Jerusalem. So that is the brief outline of the entire gospel of Mark. Now the next thing we have is the theological themes. Now you will see the dominant theme of Mark is Jesus as Messiah and son of God who proclaims the kingdom and act it out in ways that express who he is. In the first part of the narrative, the identity of Jesus as Messiah is gradually recognized. In the second part, it is intimidated that the son of man must suffer and be raised from death and this intimation is fulfilled. So that's the theological theme. The, then we see the messianic secret. Now one interesting theme in Mark is about the secrecy of Jesus identity. In Jesus first miracle, the demon says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus tells the demon to be quiet about it. And the people are left to wonder, what is this? Later, the disciples ask, who then is this? Eventually, Jesus asked the disciple that they, what they think about him. And Peter responds, you are the Messiah in verse, uh, chapter 8 verse 27. Now Jesus neither agree nor disagree, but tells the disciple to keep it quiet. Now the motive of secrecy is found repeatedly in the book of Mark. And ever since the book by William Braid in 1901 is released, it's been called Mark Messianic Secret. Now Jesus tell demons not to tell anyone who he is, who he is, chapter 30, uh, 3 verse 12 and tells the healed people to keep quiet about what happened. That is we see in chapter 1 verse 43 to 45, 5 verse 43 and chapter 7 verse 36. Sometimes the people spread the word anyway 
as we read in chapter 1 verse 47 verse 31 and 231 to 37 and it is very hard to see how Jairus could avoid explaining how his daughter who is now alive after people have seen her dead it is very difficult to keep the secret nevertheless Mark keep telling us that Jesus asked for silence now why does Mark tell us about Jesus command for silence when these commands were in, weren't successful there were several uh, theories so let's see one by one first is because they had the wrong idea of what the Messiah is uh, we'll talk about uh, these things in detail second Jesus didn't want the crowd to overwhelm him that's why he kept the secret and third to emphasize that Jesus was not looking for trouble with either Jewish or Roman authorities now let's look at each of this aspect in little more detail the first aspect the wrong idea of Messiah the first century Jews had a various ideas about the Messiah in all the speculation the Messiah was a human and most common idea that most people hoped for was the Messiah would be like King David, a military, military leader. However, what the people, people meant by Messiah is not what Jesus intended it to be. Okay. I'll repeat what the people meant by Messiah is not what Jesus intended it to be. He saw that the kingly messiah was also the servant of Isaiah 53 who would die for his people. So Jesus didn't want anybody to get their hopes up for something he wouldn't deliver. And the reference of this is in John chapter 6 verse 15. The second point is Thelman, another uh, writer, he points out that there is normally a non-theological explanation for secrecy. Jesus simply didn't want to be impeded, impeded in his movement by swarming of people asking for healing. We read that after a healed man spread the news, Jesus could no longer enter into the city. He had to stay in the country as we read it in Mark chapter 1 verse 45. Not long after that, so many people were mobbing Jesus and the in such a way that the, the men cut a hole into the roof and send the uh, person down with the help of his friend for Jesus to heal. We read it in chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. Now later Jesus had to preach from a boat so the crowd wouldn't crush him as we read it in chapter 3 verse 20. The crowd were a problem. So Jesus tried to keep the publicity to a minimum. That's second assumption. Now the third is the about two possibilities for why Jesus told people to be quiet and both may be true. But why does Mark tell his reader about it? Correct? If you see, if you read uh, chapter 1 verse 1, the, the straight away it starts with Jesus as a um, Messiah, as a son of God. So why, why does he keep, uh, but why does Mark tell us about this? Basically, especially when he is also he <clears throat> he also say uh, one second. Um, now, Mark does not the, the audience does not know who Christ is, but Mark decide to tell his reader why. The another uh, hypothesis is that perhaps for the benefit of Roman readers that Jesus is not trying to stir up rebellions against Rome. Because remember, this was written in AD 16 in the span of 30 years. So Mark wanted to, perhaps wanted to tell the Roman readers that Jesus was not trying to stir up another political rebellion. And he wanted to emphasize that Jesus had to come to suffer and die not to lead a revolt. Now his mission involved death, not just miracle working 
and it would be inaccurate to identify who Jesus is before it was all revealed. Now that is another thing also. When preaching the gospel in the first century Rome, it would be wise to keep quiet about the title Messiah since it could be interpreted as a political opponent. So something they wanted to keep it as a uh, something they wanted to keep it uh, secret. Now, what is Mark's portrayal of Jesus? Now, secrecy is a theme in the book of Mark. But Mark also wants to tell his reader who Jesus really is. Who is this man who performs miracles, who teaches with authority, and who commands the demons to leave, who pres presumes even to forgive sins? Because the readers of the Mark are told at the beginning, but it's a secret for the people in the story. Now, people know his name and where he is from. People know where is Jesus from in the book, as we see in uh, chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 2 and 3. But they wonder what role he has. Some believe, is he an agent of Beelzebul? Uh, Beel, uh, Zebul? Is he the Messiah? Some said Jesus was Elijah, perhaps meaning a prophet having a role like Elijah. People said he even make, makes the deaf to hear and mute to speak. An allusion to Isaiah chapter 35 uh, verse 3 and 4. Now Herod Antipas said he was John the Baptist all over again as we read it in chapter 6 verse 14 to 15. But Mark introduces him as Christ and as the son of God in chapter 1 verse 1. Now in the first century context, this means roughly the same, the Messiah and the son of God. And, and, and to prove that point, at Jesus' trial, the high priest treats them as equivalent terms when he says, Are you the Messiah, the son of blessed one? As we read it in 14 verse 61. Now the Messiah was considered to be human like Moses and David, an agent God would use to restore the covenant blessing back to the Jewish nation. Now claiming to be Messiah was not in itself a claim to be divine during that time. Okay, Various people before Jesus had claimed to be Messiah, but they were not charged with blasphemy. Now let me explain that. The Jewish Rabbi Akiba proclaimed Simon Bar Kobba uh, to be Messiah in AD 135 and it was not considered a blasphemous claim. It was more of a political term more than a religious term. Because in the first century, the Messiah was a very political term than it was used for a religious one. Now Jesus implies that the son of David is higher in st status than David, as we read it in chapter 12 from verse 35 to 37. How Mark leaves that as a question, the reader need, how um, basically, because Mark leaves this question for the reader to resolve this riddle by realizing that Jesus is more than a human. And because Mark is writing to people who already knew how the story ends. They knew how Jesus died. They knew how Jesus was uh, raised up. Jesus was ascended. And that's why when he write, he wanted them to the readers to come to an conclusion that he was more than a human. Then another uh, theme that we see a lot in the book of Mark is son of man. Now Jesus favorite self designation, one that he never tried to silence was son of man. We read it 15 times in Mark. Sometime it seems to be a roundabout of saying I, as we read it in chapter 2 verse 10 and 28. 
Now Jesus uses this phrase in his passion prediction also and the ransom saying also he used the phrase son of man. Now by using the phrase son of man, Jesus indicates that he is fulfilling a God assigned role to represent the people. And the term was obscure enough as not to be a political problem at that time. Now he used the term to indicate where he fit into God's plan. Then one would naturally ask, what role did Jesus see for himself? Now the writer Thelman, he points out that in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus mentioned four reasons why he came to earth. First, he came to destroy the power of demons as we read in chapter 1 verse 24. Second, to preach the good news that God's kingdom was near. Third, to call the sinners and not the righteous and to die as a ransom for many. Now one would wonder what is this ransom? Yeah, What is this ransom? Now this could lead to a discussion of the theories about how Jesus death bring forgiveness. But the gospel say little about the mechanism, yeah, the logic or the way it works, correct? And that should be no surprise because if the disciple didn't even couldn't comprehend the idea that their leader would be crucified and resurrected, there would be little point in Jesus explaining more about this in theological detail as we see there. Now the word ransom, Jesus is using it as a figure of speech. He didn't actually pay money to a kidnapper. He did not pay anything to Satan. Satan is a usurper and has no rights. But the word ransom does suggest that captives were freed. It is similar to the idea that God redeemed Israel from the slavery in Egypt. And God did it without giving any money to the Egyptian. In such a context, redeem means simply to rescue from bondage and that may all that the word ransom mean as well. It describes a result and not a mechanism. Now, Jesus said it was necessary for him to die as we read it in chapter 8 verse 31. Because it was written, as we read it in 9, uh, 12 and 14, 21. But one would wonder, where did scripture describe a death on behalf of others? Now, the best uh, candidate for this seems to be Isaiah 53. In Isaiah, the servant is a puzzling person who sometimes seems to be Israel. But especially in Isaiah chapter 53, it seems to be a person who is distinguished from Israel. He was stricken for the transgression of God's people as we read it in chapter 53 verse 8 and he is an offering to sin who died and yet prolonged his days as we read it in verse 10. He bore the sins of many verse 12 making many righteous verse 11. Just as the Daniel son of man the servant uh, represent others does for them something that they could not do for themselves. Means it was Jesus insight that the prophesied son of David was also a suffering servant of Isaiah and the son of man in Daniel. All these three roles are fulfilled in one person. Now, as we reach to the conclusion, we see that the main theme of the gospel is of Mark is the identity of Jesus in his relationship to the kingdom of God. And Marks spell this out in two stages. The first stage is about recognition of him as a Messiah and son of God that we see in the first part of Mark. Through whose presence 
proclamation and mighty works of the kingdom is manifested and the second that this must be followed by the realization that jesus must suffer and be raised from the dead the kingdom will not fully come without suffering on the part of messiah and those who share in his task which is us so messiah is no ordinary human person and the gospel is a secret revelation of who he is to those who are willing to accept the revelation and become his disciples even though they are puzzled and even included to reject it some of the significant points of the the book uh, of mark which is covered a r that jesus address people with needs we physical social spiritual he address people need now jesus basic teaching is about the rule of god understood as god's sovereign gracious power operating through himself to create a sphere of blessing for human kind and to overcome the power of satan and destroy evil that was his teaching the third part is in his own rule a uh, role in this like that of a teacher and a prophet sent by sent from god by the way in which he speaks and act with sovereign authority of god that is his role he regards god as father and prays to him accordingly now jesus closely identifies himself with this with his cause so that response to his message is expressed in terms of following him as disciples then his task is the renewal of people of israel who had fallen away from a true relationship with god despite restraining uh, restricting his activity exclusively to jews he did not exclude gentiles from his concern Jesus approves the summary of Jewish religion as wholehearted love for God and for one's neighbor that's how he summarized the whole 10 commandments he carries his principle to the utmost limit by dying for them his suffering is not something accidental but it is part of his divinity destined vocation and he regard it as being in some way on the behalf of other people and having a sacrificial and redemptive effects then the eighth part is jesus awaits the imminent cons uh, uh, consum uh, consummation of god's rule when human kind will be upheld and judged at god's bar in accordance to uh, in according with their response to himself that's uh, the summary uh, of the book of uh, uh, mark the gospel of mark now we uh, brought today's uh, lecture with the help of following three book so have you referred me referring to the uh, book uh, gary his book is from the new testament in antiquity then ian hardwar uh, howard marshall the concise new testament theology and then by dr uh, michael morrison in his new testament survey week two lectures so this is about uh, the book uh, gospel of book of mark now we can uh, do some um, clarification q and a's things that i know now i would be sharing that else i'll take it back and i'll bring it back to uh, my next uh, session and the next session we will see about uh, we will do the survey of the gospel of matthew so that's all about today uh, any question any comments that we can discuss yes sir mate such a did you uh, did you call upon someone Yeah, uh, Suri Murthy raised his hand. I think oh. he have some comments to add. Okay. Please go ahead. No, I have no comments to add. Some doubt.
Uh, I could not listen to you fully, fully, because there were a lot of disturbances here in the house. house. I, I just want to ask you, did you mention anything about the authorship of Mark? Who is this Mark? Did he say something? Yes, we talked about the possible authorship. Yes. Oh. And it is uh, the person called John Mark. Hmm. Whom both uh, uh, Peter also knew and he, they, he was known to be moving with Peter. Anything else? No, that's the possible uh, deduction we have from the data available. You have any other knowledge? Recently, what I have read, uh, and I even forgot the source, it is the same John Mark, about which, about whom Paul and Barnabas had dispute. The same John Mark who left them in Turkey and came back. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, what was the basis for that? But uh, the author was very emphatic about that. Okay. So uh, in our studies, we see the reference to uh, we see to reference to uh, John Mark is because of his pairing with Sylvanus in First Peter chapter five verse twelve and thirteen. And which, which makes it both Paul and Peter knew John Mark as being along with him and possibly he is the one who put all the things together. So what else we can do, uh, Mr. Surimurthy, is after the session, uh, Praveen will... No, no. Huh? The matter is over. Yeah, yeah, but since you were not able to hear it properly, Praveen will have a recording uh, which you can hear it and then you can bring it up uh, in, in the WhatsApp group also. Uh, some of the comments, not just questions. Okay. Sachin, I just wanted to uh, just make some comments. Uh, I do find uh, the, uh, the, the pattern you use, which is an overview, very refreshing. I, uh, I feel that uh, I'm not sure if others feel it that way. We are so used to delving into a verse and then doing exposition. But this overview perspective, I think, is very, very useful. So I wanted to mention that. And there are a few thoughts that I, I think... Uh, you know, I, in fact, uh, I have benefited from uh, the fact that uh, it was intended to be an oral presentation, something uh, I never, I never thought of. And over the, and, and the fact that it was written over a span of 30 years, I mean, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, the connection that you made between the son of man and the suffering servant, uh, very, very, um, I mean, it, it shows how there is cohesion, coherence, you know, uh, agreement from the Old Testament and, 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 you know, of course, what Jesus did. So that was very interesting. And, of course, uh, I did learn something about ransom. <laughs> they were always wondering how many dollars he paid, but uh, uh, that, that was very interesting, the, the, the metaphorical perspective that you brought. And of course, one more thought, and that is, uh, you mentioned quite a bit about uh, Jesus being the suffering Messiah uh, and conquering evil through suffering and death, which is so antithetical to human understanding. And I would feel you can add that as a messianic secret <laughs> because it is so hard for us to recognize or to accept the fact that we can win through suffering. <laughs> and of course, uh, 
and Jesus is the only God that we know uh, who under you know helps us understand that. So I thought I'll just mention those few thoughts. Thank you for that. And I and if you just put that perspective, uh, imagine Mark's reader during that time who are going under the persecution, and there's somebody coming and telling that through the persecution we are going to conquer evil and we'll be successful with that and i think that made uh, the audience then an amazing impact and for us every day because every night for us uh, things just look uh, you know uh, destroying getting destruction and that's a, it's a very refreshing uh, promise and on the structure it's something that uh, we are studying through our gcs courses so they use that uh, structure to streamline most of the books to review uh, of course, uh, you would see that when we will re, uh, reach to the gospel according to John, uh, this structure does not apply. Uh, and we'll discuss that because that was not just a one slide example uh, answer. So something we'll leave uh, for, for that session. Yes, buddy. I would just, uh, I think it would benefit each of us. Uh, the suffering that we're talking about is part and parcel of a Christian's uh, living, uh, Christian committed to God in obedience, yieldedness to his will. But uh, to, to just to uh, let uh, my brethren know that suffering should not be taken in isolation. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes, we should always remember that Christ is with us. And uh, uh, he is there all the way, you know, that uh, uh, he will not, the, the promise that he will not allow us to be tempted more than we can uh, take. But with every temptation, he'll show a way of escape so that uh, we're able to bear it. And other things, so Peter's uh, epistles also, this is for a suffering Christian. And as you say, even Mark is pointing to that. And just now you're mentioned about uh, this gospel written uh, to the uh, chosen people who were undergoing suffering to tell them this you know they um, it needs one to see things in right perspective uh, or it could shake our faith if we don't you know so just wanted to let you know that Jesus Christ is with us and that um, we have his word in us and that uh, um, uh, we have a living hope for the future. <laughs> As the Bible cautions us, if our hope was only in this world, <laughs> if our hope was only in this world, we were of most men most miserable. So it's our hope is the future. And uh, it's all we all uh, all this that we are undergoing and all that Christ came to accomplish is all leading to, you know, something, uh, uh, something very good and, uh, you know, something for eternal you know, a blessing to us and uh, something uh, something brighter and better and good, wholesome and all that, you know, uh, all that we are doing and undergoing is worth the worth, worth it uh, compared to the... In, in fact, and uh, something where I'm speaking, there are passages that come to mind. It says our suffering is uh, uh, very negligible compared to the... Uh, to the you know glories that will uh, unfold in the future so anyway uh, suffering is not easy <laughs> but god says is part and parcel of us perseverance yeah, patient perseverance uh, leading to experience and then experience gives hope and hope does not make us ashamed because the love of god is poured into our hearts so i thought of this yeah. telling you that christ is with us uh, all the way Thank you. Thank you, Bertie. I think Anil want to share something. No, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, <clears throat> is Mark the first gospel among all these four gospels? Did you uh, find that in your research? Uh, yes, I think we missed you in our last uh, this thing where we uh, where we deduce or uh, where we put together the uh, reasons that makes us conclude that why Mark is the um, why Mark is the first gospel, because 
almost everything of Mark, you find it in Matthew uh, and Luke. Yeah. yeah? Um, and so there were 10 to 12, this thing, I'll share that, uh, that did uh, this thing that concludes that Mark was written first. Right. Sachin, any information on uh, how Mark died? Was he martyred? Uh, like many of the other disciples, I'm not sure. Uh... I I need to I need to study on that. That's this thing. Anybody want to would like to answer that? Or else we can cover in the next session. To which I have one question. Uh, what uh, it's the extension of what Bertie said. Suffering should not be taken alone, and Bertie shared that it should be. Uh, we should involve Christ in it. And to that, I want to extend further. What role as you and I, as a brother and sister, have? in each other's suffering because you see suffering if you see the human understanding we often take suffering as a result of something so it's very difficult for me to involve somebody in my suffering but here uh, in through today's this thing what do you think what role you and i have as a brother and sister in my fellow brethren's suffering Yes. Uh, to answer your question, Moni, about how Mark died, uh, there is a Wikipedia article which says when Mark returned to Alexandria, the pagans of the city resented his efforts to turn the Alexandrians away from the worship of their traditional gods. So in AD 68, they placed a rope around his neck and dragged him through the streets until he was dead. So in a way, he was sort of martyred, actually. He's buried in Alexandria. And I believe he's buried in Alexandria, too. Yeah, thanks, Anil. Uh, that was, uh, I mean, once again, talking about suffering. Yeah. Uh, but Sachin, your question about uh, what is the role we can identify in suffering when we see one another suffering, and uh, from a counselor's perspective, uh, it uh, enhances empathy. You know, it uh, helps us to recognize uh, that each one of us, uh, you know, go through it and we need one another. And so I believe that suffering can actually deepen relationships through the element of empathy. Uh, it can, the relational dynamic is further heightened through you know like for example every time i watch the news and see what's happening in ukraine uh i just you know it's just so hard to accept what's happening in a christian nation um so i think one from from a one another's perspective i feel that um empathy is something which is uh, ne needed and in one sense, you know, brings in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Think to that, please. Think Thank you for that uh, last question about, uh, you know, where, what does it, what does suffering play uh, amongst us? On that note, um, I wanted to say the Lord himself involved his disciples jesus himself involved his disciples on the time that he was really battling with his own spirit with his you know lord if it is thy will take this cup away from me in that in the time that he was he, he was in agony and he was you know praying and knowing what's coming he involved them and he said pray along with me he involved the disciples. And I find that very fascinating. Usually when we ask for help or when we take help, 
what does the world deem it as when we ask for help it deems it as if that you are weak or you are poor or you are you've got no strength you've got no confidence on yourself and that is why you are asking for help the other way around is when you take help they'll say ah look at this now uh, you know they, they term it like that but from a christian's perspective it's such an important example that the lord god himself does throughout his ministry too we see that jesus involves whether it is suffering whether it is happiness and i'm not saying that you know go jesus didn't do one thing and i observe that very well that he didn't go around to the world and say oh i'm going to die so just keep praying for me or you know he didn't go around with everybody so that is not the example we take but you know so in in if we were to literally translate it into our lives i don't mean that when we are suffering through something we tell the entire world about that we are going through this problem we are going through that problem but if you trust someone and we can share it it also becomes a part of loving one another as yourself it becomes a a, a part of a, a kind of partnership with the lord and the holy spirit that we are able to share our suffering with one another by doing that by asking for help and taking help we partner with the holy spirit in the ministration of the lord in exactly the mandate that we have given that we have been given so i think it's empowering that we can uh, seek uh uh friends we can seek people that we trust we can seek people who we know love us to say i need help and also to be courageous enough to take help as we see from the example of life of jesus so i just wanted to add that and say suffering should not be regarded or asking for help or saying that i have this problem should we should never look at it as it's a it's a bad thing or it may put a name on us or it's a it's a wrong thing to do but look at it from the perspective of jesus thank you yeah and i feel testifying also plays a great role uh, during recovering uh, suffering as a reassuring help <laughs> And so normally we see if I testify, am I uh, boasting? But when you testify, somebody there knows that if God can work in this person's life in this scenario, I have a lot of chances for God to work in my scenario. So I think testifying plays a great role. So we should not see as a boasting, but to 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 testifying what God has done, and perhaps it's helping somebody. Uh, we don't know. Okay then. Uh... Let's have a closing prayer. If I can request our elder Franklin to close in prayer. So one one second, please. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, okay. okay. And let's bow our heads. Gracious Father, a loving Lord, thank you, Lord, for being with each of us. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to begin a new year, Lord, to come together, to study your word, learn more about it, and then to grow in your grace and in knowledge. Thank you so much, Father. Lord, we rejoice, Father, for, for the opportunity you give us in the hustle and bustle of life. Thank you so much, Father. Lord, we thank you for each of our participants and attendees who are coming here. Lord, thank you, Father, for their desire to come, learn, and grow. Lord, we ask your special blessings upon each of us and even those who could not join us today. Especially, Lord, we pray for all our, our pastors, lead pastors, and other pastors. Lord, be with them, Lord, and help them, Lord, so that we are able to understand your word and grow deeper into a relationship with you. Thank you so much, Father. Lord, even as we live in a broken world, in a tough world, Lord, where there is, to, to be frank, there is sin all around us, we commit our lives, Lord, praying that your grace be with us and take care of us every day, Lord, and bless all our plans 
and all our desires, Lord, so that we are able to chart our well in this coming year. Thank you so much, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.